evening, everyone. To edible education, our sixth class of the semester already. Um, we're experiencing some unusually cold weather. Um, I wanted to show you what's, a, what's alive and blooming in the garden this week. This photograph is a Ribes sanguineum, which is a um, currant, a red currant. It makes these beautiful berries. The flowers are edible and um, some people think medicinal and they, they trace themselves in terms of their usefulness, these flowers uh, back to indigenous communities. So it just has a very brief bloom like this. I captured this shot this morning in front of these palm fronds, which make it look particularly tropical. Also in the orchard right now is the um, Prunus salicina, also known as the Santa Rosa plum. Uh, I don't think the class will still be in session when these are fruiting, but I just wanted to show you what's coming. This, the, 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 uh, the stone fruit in the orchard, they require what's called chill hours in order to set up the fruit. You need like 400 hours uh, during the winter where the temperatures are below 42 degrees throughout the night. And if you don't have that, you don't get the fruit. And what's interesting about this with the uncertainty about the climate and the warming temperatures, a lot of the fruits are kind of at risk for where they're, they're planted. And um, so the other thing about this tree, it's really great pollinate, pollinizer for all the orchard. You need trees that um, really attract a lot of bees. And this is one of them. And I also just wanted to mention Luther Burbank, who uh, lived at the early part of the 1900s. He was known as the wizard of plants. And he was a, um, a botanist and a plant breeder. Have you ever heard of the Burbank potato? That's probably his most famous creation. But he lived in Santa Rosa, California, and he was an incredible self-promoter. He marketed himself at the, in the same sort of stratosphere as uh, Thomas Edison and Nikolai Tesla as being like the inventors of the 20th century, the early 20th century. And his house is still standing and open to the public in Santa Rosa. It's a wonderful place to visit. And you can actually learn a lot about um, his work and plants. The other thing that's happening right now are the seeds are sprouting. And uh, this year, I collected sunflower seeds from some of the most robust sunflowers in the garden. And one of the wonderful things about gardening is that you um, can be pretty self-sufficient once you get going. If you've started with a good seed stock, these seeds here are all sunflowers, different varieties of sunflowers, and I have to start them in the greenhouse for a couple reasons. One, because it's warm and they're protected, but most importantly, the birds, the birds are amazing. The birds will eat the little sprouts um, they just don't have the foresight to wait for it to spring into a giant plant with thousands of seeds. So um, I wanted to introduce to you a, a concept that I think is really relevant to this class. It's called hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor is when you breed different seeds from different stocks, sort of two strongs to make a stronger. You get hybrid vigor. And I think that hybrid vigor also applies, it's also called heterosis, but I think hybrid vigor also applies to innovation because bringing uh, disparate uh, strengths and resources together into a new whole creates a more robust and vigorous um, opportunity, perhaps. So this week, um, how many people got to listen to this uh, podcast? old ag new crops. If you haven't listened, please do. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. The, the way it sort of fluidly um, travels around the food system, starting with kind of cultural and indigenous issues, and then traveling up into current day agricultural practices, and then it goes into the market and trying to create 
the market for regeneratively farmed products. It's, it's really fascinating. And the other thing that's fascinating about it is that it's created with a lot of hybrid vigor from Berkeley uh, alums. And um, Sandeep Pahuja, who is the creative um, catalyst behind it, got his MBA here. Liz Carlisle, whose article you also read about this week, she got her PhD here. Allie Kelly was a former student in this class, and she's the one that invented that first um, Kernza-based macaroni and cheese for um, Annie's. Shauna Sadowski used to be on the uh, advisory board for the Center for Responsible Be Business, and Karen Leibovitz, who you heard from Zero Foodprint, uh, got her PhD here. So I just, I think it's really, you know, you know this semester we're just focused on UC Berkeley um, faculty, alumni, students, and community members, and you know, that was sort of a, a, a constraint that we decided to adopt. But I think it plays out to show how robust um, the, you know, the change makers are that are out in the world impacting the food system. So here's to Cal. Also um, wanted to showcase some of our other food systems change makers who aren't in the class this week or next week, but there's a number of students that are doing really interesting things in consumer packaged goods. So um, doing um, milk teas and um, upcycled fruit juices and seaweed and um, some bioengineered foods and, some, and decolonizing the spice trade at Diaspora Co. We had the founder of Diaspora last year um, come to the class. Um, in the weeks ahead, we're gonna start focusing more on uh, entrepreneurs who are starting companies and nonprofits. I just wanna weave the systems dance into um, the curriculum each week. And I, I like to look at the list and um, think about like last week, Christopher Gardner's presentation was so interesting where he was locating responsibility in the system and really leaving it up to you. It, it depends was his answer. What should I eat? It depends on your values and he gave us this really wonderful, complicated rubric for how to make decisions that would um, reflect our values. Uh, pay attention to what is important, not just quantifiable. Go for the good of the whole, which is an interesting challenge um, when there are so many complex and competing um, issues. And then, of course, celebrating complexity. Uh, you'll remember this slide from Christopher's presentation last week where he was trying to create um, a system to evaluate food across these four quadrants of health and nutrition, social justice, deliciousness, and environmental sustainability. And one of the, I think the things that surprised me and when I read your um, reflections for the week, surprised many of you was that um, organic foods uh, were not necessarily uh, healthier than conventionally farmed foods. And you know, when you think about it, the organic standard is really a reaction or a response to synthetic chemical fertilizer driven agriculture, conventional agriculture that uses a lot of petroleum based and synthetic um, chemicals. It's not really focused on nutrient density. Um, so it's kind of a, conf you know, we think, okay, if it's organic, it should be better for us. Well, it's, or it may be better for us with respect to the fact that it doesn't have a lot of chemicals. One of the things that Christopher didn't talk about was that by um, continuing with conventional agriculture, it was creating concentrations of power which have continuing political issues in terms of creating more equitable, just, uh, food systems. So a couple of you, I just want to thank you, those of you that um, pointed this out, a um, couple of you have discovered this new book and this new research, which it has come out just very recently this year, subsequent to Christopher's assessment of the literature, but David Montgomery and Ann Bix have um, studied nutrient density related to soil health and soil quality and biodiversity. So 
it's, it's interesting because we're going to learn in the next couple weeks about regenerative practices, which are actually, they're, they're sort of organic plus. They're, let's leave off the chemicals and let's really focus on generating soil health. So this is a very interesting um, uh, new finding. They have a great uh, podcast, if you look them up, uh, on the no-till, <laughs> the no-till podcast. So tonight, uh, we're going to focus on uh, food sovereignty and environmental justice, two really critical uh, topics here for Edible Ed. Um, just in the last hour, I received a couple of, well, I received four emails from, five emails from students in the class who were concerned and objected to Professor Hoover's presence here tonight. Um, there's been uh, issues that have been raised uh, by indigenous uh, students and other students who have felt uh, harmed or sensitized by um, her, her work and um, recent revelations about her identity. I wanted to continue with the course um, in the spirit of offering you um, the research of uh, accomplished and respected scholars tonight, Sierra and Elizabeth. If, I just want to offer you the opportunity, if you feel uncomfortable about being here tonight or you want to um, you know, not, not be here for whatever reason, um, I just want to invite you that you're welcome to miss class tonight. No penalty, no um, attendance issues. Uh, so is, would anybody like to, to, to go? It's, you're welcome to. I hope we can uh, conduct our class tonight with an air of uh, mutual respect and uh, a focus on the, the curriculum at hand. So um, with that, I'm really happy to introduce you to uh, Elizabeth Hoover, who's an associate professor here at UC Berkeley. Uh, at, in the um, Environmental Studies Policy and Management Group, and Sierra Hampton, who's a PhD candidate and budding social entrepreneur um, working with indigenous communities in Oklahoma. And I'd like to have a warm welcome for them both. Let's, let's, can you switch over the, here, I'll, uh, I'll do that for you. Everybody hear me okay? Great, thank you. All right, so I am an anthropologist by training and an associate professor in the Society and Environment Division of the Environmental Science Policy Management here at UC Berkeley. And I've spent the last couple of decades working in communities around issues of food sovereignty and environmental justice. So I wanted to kind of give you a rundown tonight about how some people are working to combine both of those things in their activism in order to provide safe, healthy food for communities. So the standard definition of environmental justice put out by the EPA is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so the, the term here, part of the issue is that um, assuming that everybody should be subjected to the same standards, and part of what many communities are arguing is that if you are reliant on your environment for subsistence, you need a different level of standards than the average suburbanite who may get all of their food from a grocery store. In Indian country, environmental justice issues uh, related to uh, contaminated sites, the mitigation of which is often significantly behind other communities, so that may be industries, mining, military bases that have emitted contamination that are impacting the environment and food sources for communities. Um, and the fact that subsistence and spiritual activities often put native people closer to the environment. So if you're relying on local rivers for fishing, if you're out hunting, um, if you're gathering water from the river for your ceremonies, that's going to put you at a different type of potential impact than, say, again, people who may not be interacting with the environment in the same way. And one of the other terms that's going to come up a lot tonight and kind of the standard definition is food sovereignty. 
And there's an organization called La Via Campesina that in the 90s started to develop this definition of food sovereignty. And they really kind of honed it at this gathering in Mali where they created the Declaration of Naileni. Um, and they define food sovereignty as the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and the right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And this is a little different from food security, which is often the term used by the public health realm and others who are developing food programs for people around the country and around the world, which food security is, are you consistently getting enough calories? It's focused on the supply end, you know, are your cupboards full enough, but doesn't necessarily specify how, where, and by whom the food is being produced, and instead focuses on maximizing food production, trade liberalization, and can sometimes lead to the dumping of commodities, um, which then could hamper food production in the places where these commodities are being dumped. Uh, the food justice movement came out of a desire to, to kind of move beyond just food security and say, how do we make sure that people have equal access to safe, healthy food, um, making sure that workers within the food system are treated fairly? And I know you have somebody coming in in the future to talk about restaurant workers, so it's everything from the workers who are producing the food to the workers who are delivering it to your plates, um, and accounting for the value of food in relation to the self-determination of community. So it's saying, if you have this food system in a country, how do you make sure that everybody has equal access to the food system? And on the other hand, the food sovereignty movement is saying, we don't want just a slice of you know, the equal opportunity within your food system, we want our own food system. And people who have written about indigenous food sovereignty specifically have said, kind of thinking about that concept of food sovereignty, adding this extra layer of recognizing social, cultural, and economic relationships that underlie community food sharing and need to be nurtured. And thinking about the sacred responsibilities to nurture those relationships to land-based food and political systems. And this photo was taken at a, um, a language school where the kids were also gardening. And the director was telling me about how you know, the, the school is the per and gardening is the perfect place to be learning language because you're doing what you're saying and you're acting out things in the language. And then the youth are also developing these relationships to these corn seeds that they're planting. So as part of a bigger project, I wanted to find out how people, you know, who were part of these farming and gardening projects around the country were thinking about and defining food sovereignty. So I had been working with some different organizations for a while and then did a big road trip in 2014. I drove 20,000 miles around the country and stopped into 40 different communities to volunteer and pull weeds and talk to people about how are you defining food sovereignty. And so when I took all of these different interviews and their answers, um, what it boiled down to was the, the importance of the restoration of physical, cultural, and spiritual health. So how do you make sure that people are getting access to traditional food because of concerns around diabetes and heart disease. So how are you, you know, ensuring that people are, are getting at better physical health? And then cultural and spiritual health. So how are you connecting people with these traditional foods that some people have lost access to or don't get access to as often as they would like? Um, there was a focus on growing culturally appropriate foods. So people were like, well, we don't want to just grow a lot of you know, kale and spinach in the garden, but we want to make sure that the traditional corn that we need for ceremonies is there. Um, other people focused on the relationship between people and each other that's developed through these food sovereignty projects, between people and the land by getting people out there working in these gardens, and between people and the food itself that they're growing. Um, some of the interviewees focused on individual, community, and tribal self-sufficiency and control. So through these gardening projects, how are you ensuring that individual people are becoming more food sovereign, that they have greater access to these foods, um, that the community itself how are you making sure that people are kind of taking care of each other, that more people have access to this food, and how the tribal government can be making sure to be passing policies and supporting this kind of food systems. Um, there was a focus on economic independence. So thinking about how people can not necessarily have to shop outside of the community, but get their food from food growers right there. Um, making sure that people have access. So the, the term access comes up a lot in food justice and food sovereignty work. So making sure that people can afford this food and can um, ha put it on their, their dinner plates. Um, there was a big focus on education. So how do you get people to want to eat this food, to want to get food from their local food producers and not just go to 
you know, grocery stores or places that are close by and cheaper. And thinking about food sovereignty not as this final destination that, okay, we have achieved food sovereignty, we are there, but as a movement and a process and a method. So something that you're continuously working towards and a method that you're applying to decision making, applying to education. So more and more people are thinking about how do you then merge together these efforts toward food sovereignty with efforts towards environmental justice. So Kyle White is a Potawatomi philosopher who's written a lot about both environmental justice and food sovereignty and food justice, and has talked about how you know, it's not often enough that people are bringing together these two concepts. And Gottlieb and Joshi, who have also written a lot about food justice, have talked about how do we take this idea of where we live, work, and play, which is part of the, the kind of community definitions behind environmental justice, and you know, also add to that where we, where, what, and how we eat. So I'm gonna bring up a few different case studies of communities that have worked toward environmental justice and food sovereignty at the same time by fighting for both of those concepts. And in the first one, um, Akwazesni is a community on the New York-Canadian border. It straddles the New York, Ontario, and Quebec, and it's bisected by the St. Lawrence River. And in the 1950s, they widened it into the St. Lawrence Seaway, built a power dam, and a number of industries moved into the area and leached PCBs into the river. And so people became concerned when they discovered in the 80s that there were PCBs that had leached into the river from these factories. How was that impacting food systems? Was it getting into the fish? Um, and what they found was, yes, it was getting into the fish. And in addition to that, it was a Mohawk midwife named Gudji Cook whose activism really promoted a lot of these health studies and made sure they were done in a community-based way. And her concern was about breast milk. So how do you think about food sovereignty beginning, not just with foods that are growing in the gardens, but the very first foods that many people are consuming um, is breast milk. And how do you make sure that that breast milk is safe for, for babies to consume? And so she really kicked off this huge environmental health study in which she collaborated with um, the State University of New York at Albany and with the State of New York. And she said, okay, we need to run these different health studies, but you can't just bring guys in lab coats up to collect breast milk from women. That's not gonna fly. You need to train women in the community to collect these samples. And it led to 20 years of environmental health research in which they found that yes, the, the breast milk of women who ate more fish had higher levels of PCBs. Um, and then worked to, to help people find other sources of protein, but also to fight to get that river cleaned up um, so that people could continue to eat local food. And as part of that fight, um, they sued the local industry, the General Motors specifically, for money to restore the environment. Um, and so with the argument that as part of restoring the environment, that there was also a cultural injury. So it wasn't just an environmental injury, um, but also language and culture are impacted when people can't be interacting with the environment in the same way. So Azadjidawadu was a cultural resources damages assessment program in which money from this settlement was used to hire elders, like the ones you see up in the corner here, to work with apprentices um, to learn the language, to learn about trapping and butchering, to learn about farming, um, and to bring kids from the, the local Akwazesne Freedom School in as part of that. And now other tribal communities are looking to this program to say, okay, how do we then hold local industry accountable for the damage to the environment and also um, receive settlements in order to rebuild language and culture programs? So another example moving kind of from the East Coast over to the Midwest is different tribal communities that have been looking to protect wild rice or manumen, um, which Anishinaabe Moan means the, the good berry. It's a grass that grows out of um, lakes, and there's a seed head at the top that people go out in canoes in the late summer and early fall and harvest, and it's been a very important food source for people in the Great Lakes for um, thousands of years. It's a very sensitive plant, and so when mines and pipelines have threatened to come through this area, people have really fought very hard to try to prevent that from happening because if that water becomes at all contaminated, the, the wild rice dies and it's very hard to reestablish it. Um, so when I was doing my, my visits in 2014, um, the Bad River Reservation, one of the threats they were facing was a taconite mine that a company was looking to put through that would 
take low-grade iron ore and refine it and dump a lot of the slag kind of back into waterways. And the concern was that this was going to get into these huge wetland areas and destroy the wild rice. Um, so, you know, the, the company was like, no, no, we're going to follow all of the existing laws in Wisconsin, don't worry. And at that same time, they were working to change the laws in Wisconsin that wouldn't hold mines accountable to some of these same standards. Um, so Anishinaabe people and their allies really worked for years to fight against this and to create a lot of bad press um, for this company. Folks like Paul Domain, who you see here with his uh, maple syrup, um, created these camps, these harvesting education and learning project camps in the woods in order to try to um, convince people that there were resources here that didn't need to be extracted out of the ground. So these camps brought people from the surrounding area to learn about foraging and harvesting things like maple syrup and mushrooms and kind of gathering um, on the land as community and hosting these different um, gatherings. And there was an elder there who had been arrested for exercising his treaty rights before. And when people came in, they had to meet with him first and kind of learn about the community struggles on the land. And then they would hold these different um, feasts and festivals as a way of trying to, again, convince people that there was other uses for the land that were not so extractive. Um, and they called this Pinocchio gold. So the Pinocchio Hills had been mined for gold before. And so part of what Paul was trying to do was to say, look, here's this other kind of gold that's much more sustainable that can be um, brought out of the land. So the taconite mine um, eventually got shot down after a lot of bad press and legal challenges, um, but people are kind of remaining vigilant to hoping that it won't come back again. There have also been a number of pipelines that have come through or threatened to come through um, that people are concerned about impacting the wild rice. Um, so the Sandpiper Pipeline was slated to cut across the entire northern part of Minnesota. Um, so I joined some of these camps and, and pipeline rides that worked to try to draw attention to this space and to try to convince people who lived in the southern part of the state who were like, oh yeah, put that pipeline up there where you know, nobody lives up there. And people wanted to draw attention to what was on that land and how important it was for indigenous people who were relying on that for food. Um, so the pipeline, the same pamper pipeline um, got tied up in Minnesota's regulatory process for about three years and then got put on hold. Um, but there were other pipelines that more recently people had been fighting against line five, line three, um, that did end up going through, even though people really pushed against it. And then the last example I'm going to talk about is in Alaska, um, where many of you may have heard about the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened in 1989. There was an oil tanker that spilled 11 million gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound. And so 1,300 miles of coastline were contaminated, and it killed lots of seabirds and otter and fish and whales. Um, and the kind of cleanup process has been ongoing. Oil is still being found on the beaches, but it destroyed the fishing economy in this area. So it really deeply impacted the native folks who lived along this coast, as well as others who relied on fishing for their um, livelihood. And so the Native Conservancy is an organization that was started by um, an EAC tribal member named Dune Lankard. You see him down here very proudly holding up this kelp. I mean, he established this organization in 2003 in order to try to empower Alaska Native people to permanently protect and preserve some endangered habitats in their homeland. Um, and as part of that, he's been looking into seaweed growing as a way of um, you know, trying to improve the economy in the area, but also for environmental purposes. Um, so kelp is good for environmental reasons. It sequesters carbon. It helps with ocean acidification, provides habitat for herring and fish. Um, the hope is that it can boost food sovereignty, that kelp farmers will be able to expand um, the Native Conservancy's subsistence and food sovereignty program and provide nutritious fresh sea vegetables for elders and other community members, and that it will be an economic boon, that it will help replace some of the diminished fishing industry that have impacted people. Some of the challenges are startup costs. So to start a new kelp farm is like $10,000, which you know, if you've been without a fishing industry for a while, that can be challenging. Um, the permitting process is complicated. It also was kind of first come, first serve. So a lot of people from the lower 48 have been kind of snatching up a lot of these permits. Um, so part of what Native Conservancy is trying to do is to help people to get these permits, to help get these kelp farms started and off the ground, and figuring out how to uh, provide the resources to process this kelp and then kind of ship it for different food products to the lower 48. So this is 
Rachel Hoover up in the corner there, um, who is from this area, she is LU, and she's making different um, kelp cakes and kelp pickles, and she's got all kinds of different um, recipes, and so they're working to try to get people excited about eating more kelp um, and also using it as a restoration. So environmental justice is required for food justice and food sovereignty. There, a clean environment is necessary to support plant, animal, fish communities that are utilized for food and in order to safely pass on cultural knowledge around harvesting and preparing food. Um, but also thinking about how restoration efforts and the new blue-green economy needs to benefit tribal people, um, which is not inherently going to happen unless people like Dune and Native Conservancy and some of these programs um, are able to, to pull this off. And then to just kind of leave you um, with this last quote here from a, an article by Mary Arquet and some other Akwesasne Mohawk scholars and environmental health perspectives, thinking about how environmental justice has to go beyond equal protection. So they write that environmental justice encompasses more than equal protection under environmental laws, which would be environmental equity. Um, it also upholds those cultural norms, values, rules, and regulations, and policies or decisions to support sustainable communities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sierra to talk about some of her work. Can folks hear me OK? Yeah? OK, awesome. Um, yes. Halito, uh, <laughs> so, uh, Sierra Hampton, Chickasha uh, Saya. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sierra Hampton. I'm uh, a member of the Chickasaw Nation, uh, which is a tribe actually uh, based in Oklahoma. Um, but I'm actually California born and raised. And I'm actually a Berkeley alumni as well as a student currently. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my background as well. Um, so I did my uh, undergraduate degree here after transferring. Um, and I was in actually political science um, and I was studying um, indigenous rights under like kind of an international relations, human rights, indigenous rights um, sort of bubble. And I was always really interested in how um, indigenous communities uh, are using activism and how they're building um, solidarity with other communities and other tribes, um, and also how they're doing um, sovereignty movements. So I was studying political science, and then uh, after graduation, I had um, a year, a two year break actually where I was working for a, a local nonprofit here in Berkeley um, dedicated to um, youth education and the, like, the achievement gap in going to college. And I really wanted to go abroad and learn about what other indigenous tribes were doing um, and, and kind of like meet them and see how they're navigating challenges um, that maybe we're facing too here on Turtle Island. So uh, I went to do a master's at Lund University in Sweden. And I was studying international development and management and I chose that program because part of it is um, you do a six-month internship somewhere, and then you do like six months field research. So um, I chose to do my field work in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, I was studying how international human rights instruments are yeah. applied on the ground by indigenous communities. And while I was having these conversations with folks, um, something that kept coming up over and over again was this importance of food. Um, both to their identity, but um, also how they assert their self-determination and their sovereignty. So it got me thinking um, about my community and other conferences or meetings or gatherings that I've been to um, here and thinking about, wow, this is actually something that is really, really um, common among indigenous peoples and a lot of, among a lot of communities as well. Um, so I wanted to learn more about it, and I started doing a lot of like home research, um, just reading articles about indigenous food sovereignty and about agroecology. And I ended up um, going to South America for like seven months um, just to learn about where La Via Campesina started um, and a little bit about their um, agroecology practices there as well. And then um, I wanted to have this kind of um, question in my mind, which was how does food relate to um, your people's uh, sense of sovereignty and identity? And this is sort of a driving thought for me. Um, and I wanted to learn about it in my community too, but being abroad, I was mostly like looking on the internet for these things. 
And I realized it's actually um, very difficult to learn about from being abroad. And the tribe didn't have that much published about it, and there weren't really articles about this that I could access. Um, and that, to me, that was like really a bummer. I was super bummed about it, both for myself and also thinking about um, other Chickasaws, because many of us don't live in our tribal territory, but kind of all over the globe. Um, and then also thinking about, like, when I have kids someday in the future, I really want to make sure that they know about our um, traditional foods and that they have it be a critical part of their identity as well. And I want to be um, a good, you know, steward of that information to them. So this is something that I was trying to look up. Um, and while I was abroad, I started um, growing my own garden as well. So I had this kind of theoretical grounding from the articles I'm reading. Um, I have this like passion and desire. Um, and then I wanted to get some of this like hands-on experience as well. So I was growing about like 50 different um, indigenous varieties of foods um, on like a little less than half an acre. And I was trying to do different like indigenous and agro uh, ecological methods. So I was learning a lot about like seed keeping um, and soil health kind of Will teed it up really nicely. Um, but yeah, different parts of the food system um, and like supporting pollinators and of course um, a lot of cooking and eating, which is like one of my favorite things also. Um, so all of this um, kind of culminating into uh, work that I was hoping would actually be helpful to my tribe. If I were to go and talk to them, um, I wanted to be able to support this thing that I'm so passionate about, right? So um, the Chickasaw Nation is. Um, comprise of about 76,000 citizens. And like I said, we live all over the world. Um, it, but our territory is in about eight square miles of land in what is now um, southern Oklahoma. But we're not actually originally from there. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but foods are really highly valued by us, our traditional foods, as part of our, um, part of our identity and our culture. Um, but there's been some kind of challenges maintaining that relationship and that connection with our traditional foods. So um, one of those things <laughs> was Indian removal. And when we talk about environmental justice, a lot of times we're thinking about um, a particular community being in a particular space, and then some outside force you know, putting um, pollutants or contaminants into that space. Uh, whereas with Indian removal, you have um, community living in one type of environment and one type of ecosystem and then being completely uplifted and forcefully removed to another location, usually with very different um, environmental factors. So if we think about traditional ecological knowledge, which is a knowledge system based um, on millennia of um, accumulation of that knowledge and passed down from generation to generation, it's very, very place-based. Um, and you have relationships with a particular land and a flora and fauna. Um, so when you have Indian uh, communities that are removed to another space, all that knowledge gets disrupted. And you now have to create relationships with these different um, flora and fauna in your new location. So that is like a really big impact of environmental justice that affected um, the Chickasaw Nation, as well as the other four tribes, and, and many other tribes as well, um, that were removed. And uh, Chickasaw Nation was removed along the what is um, called the Trail of Tears where about 100,000 indigenous peoples were actually moved just in that one um, push. So we were moved to Oklahoma. Um, and then about 100 years later, uh, we had the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma um, and Kansas and a couple other like Plains areas, um, which really kind of grew out of the twin um, challenges of drought and unsustainable farming practices, which really left the land um, denuded and you know, with very little organic matter in it. So this is um, kind of the backdrop of what we're dealing with now, um, with very little organic matter in the soils and just a lot of trouble um, finding the correct amount of nutrients. Um, and then also, we have like ongoing industrial agriculture. And it's really dominated um, production in Oklahoma. Um, and of course, the Chickasaw Nation is not immune to this, um, just like we're not immune to the industrialized diet, um, which has, you know, uh, relied very much more on highly processed foods, which have come and displaced a lot of our traditional diet. And you see um, different health-related uh, outcomes, negative outcomes related to that as well. So these are some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, but when we talk about indigenous nations, it's really important not to just approach things from this like deficit narrative. 
uh, where you think like, oh, well, they suffered so much and this bad thing happened and they're so traumatized and that's their whole story. Um, because that's not the whole story. And so the important thing to do is to take more of a desire-based approach, which is um, considering the situation that indigenous community is in, what are their desires for the future and what actions are they taking to make that future happen? So um, thinking now about some of the ways that indigenous communities can build up their food sovereignty. So in the Chickasaw Nation, uh, one of the methods we're using is education. Um, so, and, and also continuity of our traditional plants. So if you visit the Chickasaw Nation, you can see um, a lot of our traditional and culturally significant plants that um, our tribe has stewarded throughout the years and um, just made sure that we have continuous access to and a relationship with. Um, and then you have like these little informational placards all over that tell you a little bit about the plant and about our relationship to it. Um, another way is uh, growing these plants in our greenhouses to ensure that um, we will always have them uh, as part of our relationship with, uh, in the tribe. And we actually have even been able to go and get some of our traditional plants from our homelands um, east of the Mississippi. Um, and some of them grow actually very well in the Oklahoma climate too. So that's been uh, really amazing to see and to learn about. Um, and then we have folks who can come in like youth interns who might visit and, and help with this project as well. So they're getting that education and building that relationship too. Um, and then thinking about like water constraints, we also are using hydroponic systems now to uh, grow food to feed our elders. And then the last thing I really wanted to highlight about um, the efforts is uh, seed keeping. So we kind of heard some of that from Dr. Hoover as well. Um, and uh, you know, Will was talking about it, planting his seedlings. Um, keeping seeds is a way to not only ensure that like your community currently will have access um, and that our tribal elders will be able to get the resources they need to uh, perform ceremonies, but also that our future generations will have them. And it takes a little bit of this control that has been so held by the industrial agricultural system, and it takes it back into our hands. And it allows us to protect our relationship with these plants and ensure that they are cared for in a good way. So my research um, has been uh, observing these activities and learning about these challenges and opportunities um, and helping where I can. So this is me um, seed keeping with them, like going out and gathering seeds um, that are growing uh, from previous years where they planted. And um, if you look up here in like the top, you, um, I'm learning a lot about how our tribe is using uh, fire to restore the landscape and also encouraging incorporation of legumes into um, like ranchers and farmers' lands. Um, to try to get some of that nitrogen and organic matter back into the soil, um, or nitrogen back into the soil and then adding organic matter as well. Um, and we're also going to conferences um, where we talk about with other tribes regionally about how climate change is impacting our um, culturally significant plants and what we can do about that. So these are all things that I'm kind of um, participating in and taking notes on, and I'm also doing interviews with folks too. Um, all in the hope that I can gather this information and um, use it in an iterative, uh, to create iterative questions with the community about things they really want to learn and know and that will be useful for them so that my research won't just kind of languish in academia, but it's something that can actually be applied and useful to my community. Um, and then just quickly, I want to say why I came back to Berkeley for this. Um, so I had actually approached my, uh, approached my tribe before I even decided to do a PhD. I said, I'm considering it, but I would really like to work with you regardless. Um, and then uh, I returned to Berkeley because this is a space where I think we have a good opportunity to combine academic work and community-based work. Like there's a good precedence for it. And especially I felt that in um, my program, which is environmental science policy and management. Um, and I'm a second year here now, and I've really benefited from the uh, mix of faculty who are studying food systems and food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, so yeah, I've just appreciated being a Berkeley alumni. I'm happy to be a Berkeley student again and to be able to do this work. So Chukmashki, um, thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mic on. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Just come back at 10 after the hour 
And if you have some questions for Sierra and Professor Hoover, you can put them up on the wall, or you can also um, ask them on the uh, microphone. Oh, one more thing. Um, this week, I harvested some more citrus. And I know I wanted to show off the largest orange of the season. This is a giant navel. I don't know who gets this, but, uh, but I also wanted to just forewarn you, these look like oranges, these little fruits, but they're actually limes. They're calamondins. So don't bite into them like an orange, but go home and make a margarita <laughs> with them, okay? So enjoy your break, enjoy your fruit. You know, I was, um, how many of you, how, how many, who, who here has plant, planted a seed? It, it's, it, that's wonderful to see. It's, it's a pretty amazing experience, isn't it? You have to really, um, it's, hard, it's hard to talk about, right? It's kind of inevitable what, what happens. I was realizing the other day uh, when I was feeling like a little blue when, you know, you kind of look at the news too much and um, my, my act of, um, I don't know what kind of act it was, it was a, an act of hope and optimism was to just go plant seeds. And um, it's pretty miraculous what, what happens. And they also really, this word tending, which comes from the word attention, attending, is so integral to um, caring for seeds and plants and, and nature. You know, I, I, Sierra, I really enjoyed seeing those um, images. You showed an image of like a circular garden. Can you talk a little more about that? that that looked really interesting. Yeah, um, so it's called the Spiral Garden and it's uh, our biggest native plant garden that we have. Um, and it was actually designed um, by like an indigenous artist. Um, and a lot of our things are spiral, um, mostly related to our traditional uh, homeland in near the Mississippi River. Um, and when we draw the Mississippi River, it, it's kind of like uh, the waves crest over and then spiral into the next wave. Um, so that's like a, an important symbol for us. Um, so someone designed the garden that way and also so that people, um, when you're walking through it, you really have to spend a lot of time kind of going around um, through the spirals too. So. Mm -hmm. The spiral appears in nature in a lot of places, in plants, in the sunflower, the, this Fibonacci pattern, this unfurling. So it's such an interesting energy, yeah. Um, one of the readings that we had this week was really about um, this rise in regenerative farming and its connection to indigenous practice and sort of being, you know, presented as a brand new thing with 10,000 year old history. Um, and you were talking a little bit about the um, nitrogen fixing this transition to, or the need for more legumes, uh, both in the soil and in our diets. Um, do you, is, is that an indigenous, are those indigenous um, foodstuffs, or are they being introduced for the health of the farm, or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, part of my research is looking at like where our knowledge is coming from, because yeah, we have traditional ecological knowledge, um, but of course we have knowledge that's coming in from other sources. And that's kind of what um, agroecology looks at as well. It's um, looking at how indigenous knowledge and, and more like this Western science model can work together, um, which is why I chose to like apply that, um, that frame. Um, and so with the legumes, I mean, that's something that's been, yes, practiced um, by so many tribes all over uh, the world really. Um, where you have this relationship um, where legumes support um, maybe structurally, but also with nitrogen in the soil um, for millennia. Um, but it's also, of course, something that's been noticed by um, Western uh, science as well and is now being incorporated into like ideas of regenerative agriculture. And I'm sure you'll learn more about that when you have a speaker come. Um, and, you know, uh, 
so it's a little bit hard to say like where it's being attributed directly now. Um, you know, did the folks learn it like at a at a modern university, or is this just something that we've always known? So that's kind of one of the things I'm looking at. Um, but it's definitely something that has roots in indigenous communities, um, as well as you know being picked up by by Western culture now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Professor Hoover, how's your research um, proceeding these days unfolding after your twenty thousand miles of travels <laughs> across the continent? Yeah, well, that also, I don't know if you want me to, to touch on some of these questions it, here sure. um, that folks have had about kind of how that is going to be unfolding um, after finding out some things about my family and my background. So to give you some context um, to the announcement that the professor made at the beginning of class, um, over I've spent my entire life identifying as a Native person because that's how my family raised me. That's how my parents raised me to be proud of that ancestry. We spent a lot of time um, you know, participating in powwows and ceremonies and events and working closely with communities. And this was the identity I was raised with. And this past summer, um, somebody approached me who had done a lot of research, genealogical research, archival research um, into my family and said, you know, none of those folks are on these tribal roles. You don't have the documentation to back that identity that you were raised with. And this was a shock not only for me, but for my family as well. This wasn't something that I, an identity that I fabricated. Um, this is something that I was raised with. And so I put out a public statement, um, kind of hoping to start this discussion of this is what I'm going through. I'm going to step back and I'm not going to identify in this way. Um, and some people took it very differently and it triggered a lot of people, um, upset a lot of people and really kind of started this huge firestorm. And it's, it's been a mess. So what I'm working through now is um, listening and trying to, to figure out who has felt hurt by this and how and why. Um, there are currently restorative justice circles happening in our department to give people the, the space to come together without me to talk kind of among others in their, their cohort about why and how they felt harmed by this. Um, and then there'll be circles that will kind of bring me in as well so that I can hear from people so that I can figure out how going forward to, um, to make amends in those way to the students who are here who have felt harmed. When it comes to the other community organizations that I've worked with, um, it's been a real mixed response. So what you see online is kind of a very, one very particular side of the response. Um, but I've had a lot of people reach out to me some of whom um, want to me to still work on some of these projects, and others who are like, you know, this big firestorm mess, we don't want that impacting these organizations. And so most of the boards that I have worked on, I stepped back from because I didn't want this controversy to impact them. Um, so going forward, working on these different food sovereignty projects, for right now, for the people who still want me working on these projects, I'm kind of doing it quietly behind the scenes um, so as not to drag any of this mess and controversy into that work that's being done, but to still where people want my labor to contribute that labor, whether that's in helping to design surveys, whether that's being in gardens, pulling weeds, planting seeds, that kind of thing. Um, and so somebody asked here, you know, am I gonna publicly apologize? At some point, when I figure out how to appropriately do that, when I hear from folks um, about how they have felt harmed and I know the best way. I don't want to just throw an apology out there to make some people happy because other people have said to, you know, have been very adamant to me, like, no, don't, and you don't need to do this. And um, other people have very much felt that they need an apology. And so I want to make sure that the next public statement that I made is done um, thoughtfully and taking all of these different um, feelings and, and um, harms into account. So that's kind of so going forward, again, there's some projects that I'm continuing to work on, um, you know, around recipes, around kelp, around some of these other things. I had a book that I spent eight years working on based on the, the road trip as well as, you know, interviewing 30-something chefs and spending months in different pipeline camps and cooking for folks. Um, and so rather than put that book out in its current form, I'm gonna go back and talk to all those folks again and find out do they still wanna be part of this project? 
um, knowing all of this going forward. And I will update and revise that book and then put that out there. So kind of that's where my, my work in the food sovereignty movement is, is headed from here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vera, I read in your um, little bio that you wanted to start some kind of an enterprise or I don't know what to call it, like an, an act, a social venture or some, some, you want to become a social entrepreneur of some kind or I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm, that's kind of my background too. And I was interested to hear, I, I really love to explore this kind of transition from the academy into the world and translating research into action and impact. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that too. Right, yeah, and thank you for bringing that up of like the importance of like mixing the two because like the most helpful advice I ever got when I was an undergrad here was a grad student who was like, if you're gonna do a PhD, go live your life a little bit and then come back, you'll be like much more interesting and much more prepared. Um, and I think that that's like very true. You need to get like out of academia for a little bit and, and, and live a little and get us some experience. Um, and <laughs> so now like going back into academia and thinking about what I wanna do when I get out, um, I actually do wanna stay in academia um, as a professor. Um, I have this like dream professor activist uh, ideal going. <laughs> so um, hopefully that'll work. But for the, yeah, what you're talking about, um, kind of wanting to start like an, a, an NGO um, with my tribe or in, in our tribal territory um, that would help uh, youth, like do maybe like a summer camp with youth where they would come and be able to grow um, different plants and learn about um, how they're grown and all the things that go into that, like soil health and pollinators and um, just being good stewards of the land. And then also um, how to prepare that food in a way that is, um, you know, efficient and accessible for a lot of different communities. Because even, you know, within the tribe, there's variation and, um, you know, affordability is an issue. Time is an issue. All of these things. Um, so being able to prepare it and then also um, connecting them with elders who can tell them some of the stories that they remember from preparing and growing these foods as well. Um, so having that be... Um, a program with youth is kind of recognizing that, that youth can be, and, and often our um, studies show like big change makers in, in the food system and in, in their parents' diets as well, because they're learning these things and then they go home and they tell their parents about it and they prefer these certain foods um, and they maybe like even shame them on some <laughs> like practices or encourage them on others. And then um, the whole household starts to shift. Um, so really kind of recognizing that dynamic and also just making sure that it's something um, that has continuity because after, you know, I'm going to die someday and, you know, I want to make sure that this is something that's going to live on in our community um, and that, you know, these, these kids will have um, the, the tools that they need and the experiences that will really um, encourage them to keep doing this work. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe could you talk a little bit about the pressures from the commercial world on seeds that, that are um, threatening uh, food sovereignty. I mean, Michael Pollan was here a couple weeks ago and he touched on, we were touching on the concentration of power, but we didn't really elaborate on seeds. And in the, and in the seed world, it's pretty intense. So maybe you could fill us in a little yeah, on that. Seeds are, are complicated and especially for communities that are working specifically with heirloom seeds. Um, there's some real controversy about whether you should sell seeds. So if people are thinking of seeds as relatives, should you sell and exchange your relatives? Um, but there are also people who are like, well, if we want people to be growing out these seeds for the community, how do they pay their bills? Um, you know, they can't just send in some seeds to the electric company to cover their, their bills. So how do you make sure they're taken care of? Um, so there's kind of a robust seed exchange network. Um, I was just on the phone with a, a friend the other day who is in Oneida, Wisconsin, whose family um, is part of this corn growing cooperative. And part of the way that they got around not selling seed was processing all of this corn into food and selling the food. So selling it as soup corn, as ground corn, um, selling the soup itself. Um, but yeah, there's, there's controversy, especially when outside corporations, um, seed companies 
have kind of you know, collected indigenous seeds and then sell those seeds along with the indigenous names and stories as a way of promoting those seeds, but the profits just go to the seed company and not to the communities who stewarded those seeds for a long time. And patenting them too. So that's been a concern. Um, and, and part of what's complicated is thinking about um, how then do you prevent that from happening? You know, the patent system is complicated. And you know, there's been a lot of you know, talk round and round about how do you, um, you know, patents are generally held by individuals or by corporations. And you know, years ago, so it was the Diamond v. Chakrabarty Supreme Court case that led to the ability to patent life. So he was a, a researcher with General Electric. He developed a bacterium that could eat um, PCBs and contaminate oil and wanted to patent that bacterium. And it went to the Supreme Court because you couldn't patent living things. And the Supreme Court said yes. And after that, it really kind of unleashed the ability to patent a lot of different things. And when I was teaching at Brown, um, Mr. Chakrabarty came and, and gave a talk. And I had the chance to, to ask him, you know, visit with him beforehand. I said, so you have all of these communities now who are really concerned about their seeds being patented. And they don't, they're not comfortable patenting their own seeds because they don't think that's a relationship you should have with seeds and you know, who's the individual who holds the patent on these seeds when it took generations of grandmas selecting at the end of each season which corn cobs get left, you know, kept for seeds. And that's what leads it to be this color and this flavor. And so who holds that patent if it's a community process? And I said, so you know, how do you feel about the fact that this case that you won has now led to all of these thorny issues in communities? And he goes, well, they should just patent their own seeds. So he really couldn't think outside of that of system. this box and this yeah. process, yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite books is called uh, The Gift by Lewis Hyde. I don't, have you, either of you seen it? it? It talks about gift economies and seeds were really a big part of the gift economy of certain communities. And, and still are, yeah. I was gonna ask mm -hmm. if it's still present in some of the communities you've studied or this idea that you, um, you, you give a gift without expectation of something in return um, and oftentimes the seeds were the gift as really next year's food <laughs> next year's harvest and um, and giving away the most robust seeds was a, a very powerful gesture of generosity and and sustained nourishment so um, and can come back to benefit you in the end. So right. Clayton Bracope is a seed keeper that I've worked with, and he tells the story about this guy who was always giving away seed and giving away seed, and one day his seed shed burned down, and everybody's like, oh my god, your huge seed collection is lost. And he was like, well, no, actually, because I've given away all of these versions of these seeds, so he just was able to call on all the people he had given seeds to over the year to get back um, in some of those ways. And you know, a friend of mine was just telling about how he's always giving his cousin seed because his cousin has lousy seed corn. <laughs> so he's like, well, if I give him good seed, um, then when his pollen blows into my field, uh, then I have a better crop as well. Um, and we all have a better um, you know, food source. <laughs> you, you both probably know Ade Brione. Um, First Nations. Mm -hmm. She came to speak at the class a few years ago, and she talked about how the children in her tribe are brought up to listen to nature with really deep, deep listening. And um, listening to her speak kind of changed my whole relationship as a gardener because she really s described that the plants really have voices and that if you listen carefully, you can hear, you know, sounds a little different to a Western ear, but when you start to try it, it's, it's really interesting. Do you have practices like that in your community at all? Or Yeah, definitely. Um, I can't say that it's, I mean, there's, there's challenges, right, with carrying that on. Um, and there are like other competing things to listen to now, right? <laughs> um, but definitely the idea that you learn from nature by observe, like nature is the best teacher, and you learn from it by observing and listening um, and seeing how these different, um, how this system works and how different relationships between like animals and plants or between different plants or the soil and the plants 
um, how all these things are connected. And you do that by spending time um, in, the, in the land and in that space. Um, so definitely, I think it's still, it's still a very big thing. Um, and, and then trying to get folks to have that time and have that uh, mentality is, is something that's ongoing. I was wondering too if you could share a little bit more about where food sovereignty is being studied. Is it are there other folks on campus working on this topic? Are there other schools? Um, you know, where are the I think clusters? Arkansas has an amazing yeah. master's program that's geared toward. It's a policy and it's geared toward helping communities write food sovereignty policies. Um, a lot of so for federally recognized tribes, um, you're they're able to write their own policies around um, environment, food, that kind of thing, or they can adopt federal policies. And often tribal communities will just adopt federal policies because they don't have the resources or the, the know-how to kind of write similar types of policies. And so part of um, what that program is doing is to, to help people think through and write policies specific to each community as a way of really promoting food sovereignty in that way. So are there other, besides University of Arkansas, other programs or Humboldt State is a um, Humboldt food State. sovereignty lab. Just, what, just for the students to, mm -hmm. to know where to where else to look for resources. Um, Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz does a lot of like food system, not necessarily food sovereignty, but like food system work. Um, so like that's a good resource. And then um, actually University of Oregon um, is doing a lot of work with uh, the tribes there. They have like a good relationship with the Karuk um, and the Yurok in the, in the region. Um, so I think if you can look for universities that like have strong collaborative relationships with indigenous peoples from that region, that's usually going to be a good spot um, to, to learn about food sovereignty. Charlotte Cote at University of Washington runs a little food sovereignty conference every year. She's written a lot about food sovereignty in her um, New Chalmers community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm going to um, finish up a little bit early tonight. Um, I'm going to let Viana talk about the assignment. We're going to um, skip attendance you tonight. You want to talk about hydroponics? Oh, you want to talk? OK. Somebody There's had a, question a really about interesting yeah. question that I'd love to know kind of where you're coming from. There's nothing native or place-based or land-based about hydroponics. How is growing food for our elders with hydroponics without life and soil food sovereignty? Um, which I thought was a really kind of interesting perspective. Um, you know, in having discussions around what is food sovereignty with people in different communities, a big part of it is um, you know, that community decides what food sovereignty looks like. And sometimes that's really rooted in traditional food systems and um, you know, the ways that people have historically and culturally produced food. And in other cases, people have said, well, you know, if you want industrial farming and that's what your community is pushing for, that could be food sovereignty. So sometimes food sovereignty for communities is really meaningfully linked to traditional food and traditional food practices. And sometimes it's, how do we create a lot of food? Um, so the, the people that I've talked to who've pushed to try to get into hydroponics, um, there was one project on the, the Bishop Paiute Reservation. And he said, well, you know, water here evaporates quickly, and we don't have a lot of water. And so if we can do aquaponics indoors, we're able to grow these vegetables, and it um, you know, doesn't use as much water. Another community that I talked to, the Cachada in Louisiana, um, you know, had an, a hydroponics project, but it was a monocrop. And so when a blight came through, it took out like three greenhouses full of lettuce and tomatoes. And so it was like, okay, that's a challenge in that, you know, they were cranking out all these vegetables and it was great. Um, but because it was still a monocrop, it mm. failed quickly in that way and kind of really put a dent in their food sovereignty operations. So, you know, some people have been interested in hydroponics as a way of trying to produce food more quickly and efficiently than they're able to on the soils that they have access to. So as Sierra mentioned, some communities have been relocated to places where um, they don't have great soil for farming. And so this is seen as a way of trying to, to work around that. Um, and sometimes it works well and sometimes not so much. Yeah, and just to kind of build on that, I think it's a really interesting question. And actually, like when I first heard about hydroponics, that was like, oh my god, no soil, what? Like it was, it was, yeah, impactful thought to me as well. Um, and I think, yeah, like Dr. Hoover raises a really good point that it does depend on the tribe um, and on how people define their own food sovereignty. Um, for me, I was thinking about it in in terms of like, well, for one, water is also life, um, and two, um, 
a lot of indigenous practices are based on like how we can best steward things. Um, so if you don't have good soil or you are worried about water constraints, you don't want to just keep you know, consuming water until you run out, right? You need to maybe make some adjustments and you need to incorporate new techniques. Um, and this is one way of doing that. But it is very much still a question in debate, um, even like just in the, when the, there was a picture I had of um, in the Chickasaw Nation where we were meeting with other tribes and folks were talking about the different conservancy efforts that they're doing or like restoration. Um, and there was a big debate uh, raised about whether we should be using greenhouses or not. Because a lot of people believe, or some people believe that, um, you know, you need to be able to restore the land to the point that the plants have the autonomy to choose to come back. Mm. Um, <laughs> because a lot of them are still waiting in the soil. Um, and so that was like a perspective. Mm. And I like very much resonate with that. And then there's also this perspective of like, well, we want to ensure that we have these plants and we are still stewarding them and taking care of them um, as best we can. And so that's you know, something to resonate with also. So it's, it's very much alive today, this, this conversation. Um, and it's not settled by like any one group. It, everybody has their own interpretations of it. So it's a really interesting question. Thanks. So some of the plants you showed, the, the Achillea, the yarrow, I mean, these are medicinal plants. Are, are there still medicinal applications? Or is that kind of folkloric? Or how, how is sort of the, the ancient and the modern manifesting in, in the communities? Yeah, um, so they're still used um, by folks who know how to use them. Not everybody does. And so you don't want to just be like tinkering around. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we do have a couple of folks who are tinkering, uh, which is interesting. Um, but even like <laughs> when I went to this conference, um, someone was like had made chapstick and it had like yarrow and all these different other medicinal plants that they had used. Um, and she was talking all about how, you know, these things that you grow in your backyard and then you can make like this really nice tea and it's good for this, this and that. Um, so it's very much still practiced, um, but just, yeah, by different, uh, different individuals in the community um, have that knowledge and try to share it with others. Um, some don't always want to share it, um, or certain medicines can be dangerous if you don't do it correctly. Um, so yeah, there's, there, it's a mixed bag, but um, yeah, we do have people who are still like incorporating it into modern necessities like chapstick, which is really great. Yeah. One, one more question. What does it mean to be indigenous? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, well, for I think it's different for everyone. Um, but for me, uh, it means like a responsibility and to honor the relationships that um, I have between like my community um, and between my family and other indigenous peoples. And I think it means um, you know, a relationship with, um, with plants and animals and just nature that has provided for us, um, to be grateful for that and to try to do my best to, um, to reciprocate. Um, and I also think it means to be in relation with other indigenous communities as well. So, um, you know, my tribe is from Oklahoma, but I grew up in California. So one of the things I try to do um, is ensure that I can, you know, bring awareness to issues and try to support issues that are affecting people here. You know, like we have the Ohlone shell mounds. Um, that's an issue that is like very, very important to the people who, you know, whose land we're sitting on right now. Um, and then also uh, like one of the other, so this is like my main dissertation project that I talked about, but I also work um, on fire and the use of fire by different tribes um, and how federal recognition status influences um, their ability to use fire. So I think like supporting fire and, and getting that, um, trying to raise awareness about that and be supportive of tribes who are trying to restore fire um, or grow their fire programs is also something that puts me in good relation and is just um, what it means to be a good guest on, on another people's lands. So I think having that awareness um, is also an important part. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? I think building off of um, just this question here is about what does it look like to be an ally? And so what you were saying about supporting um, the issues that are important to people here. Somebody asked, what does it mean to be an ally in the movement for native food sovereignty and what can students do to learn about local efforts? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the projects that I went to visit um, were in native communities, but staffed by AmeriCorps VISTA workers or other 
um, non-native folks who were farm managers, and you know, some of the farm managers I talked to were like, okay, my job is to work myself out of a job. You know, how do I train other people to be able to run this farm without me? Um, but the, the, you know, people welcomed the AmeriCorps Vista workers because the labor was needed. Um, they just, they needed people to help organize and pull weeds and plant things. Um, so what can, where can students go to learn about these local efforts? Um, you know, here in the, the Bay Area, we have another professor who was asking, and um, you know, there's the indigenous permaculture group that's looking for volunteers sometimes. The Cultural Conservancy has a, a farm that uh, is geared toward producing food for native people, and they're looking for volunteers sometimes. Um, and so I think, you know, in your own communities where you come from, there may also be uh, organizations that are looking for that extra bit of labor. You know, over the years, I've had students do projects for some of the organizations I work with that are kind of gathering up different policies and writing policy reports that communities have then used to kind of, you know, shape um, projects going forward and, you know, working on grant applications. Um, so there's that kind of desk work that sometimes isn't as exciting as the being in the garden work, but is also can be helpful for, you know, grassroots organizations trying to get off the ground. Yeah, and just to add to that real quick too, I think um, a really good starting point is also um, tribal websites. Like so many tribes have their own website and they're usually very forthcoming about the challenges that they're facing and like their top concerns. Um, and there's usually some sort of direction on what you can do to support. So like just go straight to the source and, and find out from them um, is a really good option too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also wanna thank everyone in the class uh, for being here tonight. And I also wanna thank you for your really generous and thoughtful uh, reflections and uh, what you're writing. I mean, I, reading it each week really inspires me and gives me a lot of hope and um, makes me uh, feel really positive about what this group of uh, students cares about and um, wants to uh, focus their energy and attention on. So I just wanna thank each of you for, um, for what you're sharing. And I also wanna thank the teaching team and Diana, you can uh, take it away. So let's have a, a, a thank you for Dr. Hoover and Sierra. Thank you.